everything I felt I had to say on the subject of Easter uh, for this particular week. And I knew there was something missing. And I went, I went to bed last night, and it dawned on me, just as I was about to go to sleep, what it was that I was missing, that I needed to say today. And by the time I woke up, I'd forgotten. Um, and then I got, and you see, none of you think that Twitter is a godless thing, because I got a tweet from one of my colleagues in California that linked to uh, an article written by Reverend L. Jim Matulski, who was an MCC uh, minister who was responsible for me coming to this church. Uh, so if you disagree with that, you need to take it up with Jim Matulski. And he wrote this piece, this wonderful piece, for um, the newspaper in San Francisco. So I read it, and it hit me. Ah! I know what it was that I had to say. Now, I don't know whether it will mean something to all of you. I don't know really whether it means something to me. Yeah, I guess it does. But what I had to say was, our salvation is worked out in flesh. Our salvation is worked out in our bodies. It came back to me. What St. Paul was told, every time he prayed to God, complaining about some condition he had. We aren't told what it is, but many church commentators think it could have been his sexuality. We are told again that God came back to him after he'd asked, take this thorn out of my flesh, take this away from me. And he said, my grace should be sufficient for you. My grace should be sufficient for you. You need to be happy with what I gave you. You need to be happy with the body that I gave you. You need to be happy with what that body does. And you need not put large areas of your life, I'm paraphrasing a little what Paul says here, large areas of your life into boxes which have to be kept in the dark, out of the way of your spirituality, out of the way of church, out of the way of your faith. We are all made for redemption. And that redemption happens in the flesh, not in the realms of the mind not in the realms of the intellect. Because believe you me, I've been redeemed so many times in my mind. I've also redeemed the rest of the world several times in my mind. All it takes is for me to sit down with a good friend with a cup of tea and we put the world to rights. Mentally, we can solve all these problems. It's very easy. It's working them out in the flesh that is the problem. Now, it's a matter of some consternation and upset to some Christians that actually the gospel is extremely fleshy. It's all about that Greek word, sarx, which means meat. It means flesh as muscle and vein and sinew and bone is flesh. It's not some symbolic term. It really means flesh. That Jesus was God robed in flesh. That Jesus was very God, very man. That Jesus was both the sort of thing we like to think of, that is the God which is sufficiently distant that we don't have to deal with it, too closely on a daily basis, and the sort of God which is extremely hard to deal with, the sort of God that is robed in a body like ours, that does all the things that we do, that eats and drinks and sleeps and snores and belches and farts. <laughs> it did, it's true. It, Jesus, if he ate any sort of pulse or bean, he probably had gas on occasion. Now that's shocking because we've turned Jesus into something so remote that it's hard to believe that he could have ever suffered anything. He was a wispy thing that floated around in the clouds with a beatific expression on his face and blonde hair and blue eyes. The blonde hair and blue eyes are apparently very important. A dear friend of mine in London had a picture of Jesus posted on his Facebook page. Um, and I posted a picture of Jesus black on his Facebook page. And I said, just a little bit of a counterweight there for your Nordic Jesus. And believe you me, some people were very upset by that. And I had to really ask myself, what was it that upset them? Do they really think that the guy who lived 2,000 years ago had blonde hair and blue eyes? So either image is equally useful, equally versatile, but still, I'm getting onto one of my soapbox issues there. I did believe that this was a sub. And I'm still going to give you part of it, so if you're likely to get bored, have a nap now. And I'll occasionally say words very loudly to wake you up. <laughs> and if I see you snoozing, I shall come and pinch you. <laughs> um, <laughs> First, let me come clean. One of the main reasons 
I left the Church of England, and contrary to popular opinion, I was not thrown out of the Church of England. <laughs> I still officially, apparently, hold credentials in the Church of England. I am still officially on very good terms. Now, whether they strictly agree with my ministry is another matter entirely, but I was not booted out of the Church of England. One of the reasons that I found the Church of England difficult to deal with is the doctrine issue. Now, when it comes to explaining what Easter is, which in itself is a ridiculous thing to do, because we must remember that at the heart of Easter is a mystery which none of us can explain. This is the realms of faith, ladies and gentlemen. If you want solid fact that you can take to the bank, Easter and Christianity is probably not going to be for you. And reading the Bible as if it was a textbook may make you feel more comfortable, but it's only going to end in falsehood and misery. Because that is not the way the truth lies. The way the truth lies is somewhere else entirely. Now, doctrine gets us all into trouble when people see it literally. Doctrine is just like theory in science. Some theories are pretty solid. In fact, some theories are now so solid that nobody uh, questions them anymore. And in fact, the most solid theories of all, like the theory of relativity, are known to be solid because you can test them and you can even make predictions about uh, what the world is going to do in the future because of those theories. But some theories are decidedly in the realms of guesswork. And the same thing goes with Christian doctrine. Some Christian doctrine from some Christian churches uh, is, let us say, speculative. Speculative. Some people will believe it literally, and some people will see it as allegory, an attempt to approach God through symbolism and metaphor. Now this is very much like the map analogy again, you know? If you look at a road map, it can get you to your destination. It can get you to your destination, and in religious terms, a destination is God. Okay, amen? Are you with me? Amen. But that road map does not contain real roads, real mountains, or real forests. That blue line on the map that has I-10 written to it is not a line of concrete and asphalt stretching from Florida to Southern California. It's a line on the map. But that line on the map suggests something which leads us to where we want to go. Doctrine is very much the same. When we start thinking of doctrine as the absolute literal truth in the same way that we think of Oh, I don't know. The fact that there are 10 years of the decade, we get ourselves into some deep trouble. And most of us in this room today have been on the wrong end of that sort of approach on several occasions. And as we experienced it, we should know better. So we have no excuse for going into the realms of children's stories in order to comfort ourselves when we know better. So if because of our experience, we know that our Christianity calls us to really look deeply at Scripture, to study Scripture, to try and understand what was behind the minds of those who wrote Scripture, we have no right suddenly quoting it as if it was a literal truth when we want to, when it suits us. If we want to take the stick away from the fundamentalist Christians that is used to beat us with, we can't pick it up ourselves whenever it suits us. We just can't do it. This is one of those messages which you're forced to preach over and over again. Because it's one of those things which is in human nature to do. Because it's comfortable, it's convenient, it's easy. You know, life is not easy. Amen? Amen. Thank you. I do so love it. Do you know, I thought when I came to America to preach, I was going to be in congregations where they shouted amen at the top of their voice all the time. I thought it was going to be wonderful. But a little encouragement is sometimes needed. <laughs> because it's really encouraging if you're a preacher and people say, Amen! It's also deeply scriptural because it meant, we're with you. And so say all of us, we agree with you. Because sometimes preachers start to think that they are going down one of those tributaries, an argument where they're gradually losing people, and then they're losing more people, and eventually there's somebody nodding vigorously at the back, and everyone else is going... <laughs> anyway, the resurrection cannot be explained.